Um, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of Charles Mingus's birth. Uh, we have a concert this evening. I imagine a lot of you know about this already, but I feel like I should say that just in case you haven't heard. Uh, it's going to be in Jordan Hall. It will feature our two guests here, as well as many students and faculty members at New England Conservatory. Um, but today, we could talk a little bit about Mingus's legacy uh, as a composer, performer, um, and I'd uh, like to maybe just start by introducing our guests, Earl McIntyre. I was just saying, I think I, I must have 30 LPs that he played on, mostly bass trombone. I know you played two bass yeah. as well. Even though I didn't record with Charles. Oh, yeah? No, okay. but but I played with him for quite a while. Yeah. Well, you know. Well, a, you'll have to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about it. <laughs> um, but it's a real privilege to have Earl McIntyre, who, who plays regularly with the Mingus Big Band uh, currently, and uh, Jason Moran, who's, of course, on our faculty, um, and studied with Jackie Byard. I mean, I thought it would be appropriate to get that perspective as well. Um, Jackie uh, was, of course, part of one of Mingus's greatest groups. Uh, so maybe I thought we could start off by just telling us a little bit about your experience with Mingus. Uh, maybe first of all, with his music. I mean, if it was anything like me, I heard his music before I really knew much about him. And then, of course, if you worked with him in any way, I'd be interested in hearing about that. And uh, Earl, do you want to start it? Start us off, Earl McIntyre. Hi, everybody. Good. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I was just telling a couple, these two gentlemen here. Uh, you know, the first album I actually heard of Mingus's was uh, "Let My Children Hear Music," and it was actually one of several albums that a bass player named Walter Booker had gotten from Columbia, you know, I think at that time, it was, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was Columbia, but anyway, uh, I'd say maybe a year or two after that, maybe not even that long, uh, after hearing that album, I, I had been on the road with a blues singer named Taj Mahal, and you know, and uh, I was 17 when I was out on the road with him. I came back, and I got a call from Ornette Coleman in his office, and uh, they, they, they wanted to put together an orchestra to play a piece by Ornette Coleman. And I said, great, you know, I was very interested in this. I went to the rehearsal, and he has a 100-piece orchestra, but everybody's writing out their own part. And uh, this got old pretty quick, you know. I think we got maybe two measures the first rehearsal. So then shortly after that, I got a call from, I believe it was Bob Stewart, who was playing tuba with Charles and, they, and uh, they were actually getting ready to perform the music. I didn't realize it when I got the call, but they were getting ready to, to perform the music uh, from Let My Children Hear Music. And so I decided that I would go, you know, play with Charles. And uh, the band played I think it was the gate, village gate, and the vanguard. And then uh, they actually kind of created this club called the Mercer Street Lounge, I think it was. It was opposite the public theater in New York. Because, you know, George Wayne really wanted to present this music for what at that time was Newport and New York. In fact, after we played the club they created, it burned down, I found out. but. Uh, we we got tight. I guess this was over about a month. And then comes the final concert, and it turns out that Mingus was opening for Ornette Coleman, and the piece that Ornette was writing was called Skies of America. But like I was, like I was telling them, the piece that Mingus wrote for a string quartet and I believe it was with harp, sounded bigger than Skies of America, you know, and uh, 
you know, after some time after he had passed, then I got a call from uh, his widow, Sue Mingus, to join uh, the Mingus Big Band. And I've been affiliated with them for, I guess it's been over 25 years now. So that, that's kind of, in a nutshell, my, my experience with Charles. Just, if you don't mind, I have a sort of follow-up question, because we're, we're actually playing uh, Shoes of the Fisherman's oh, okay. uh, wife at the concert on Thursday. We're doing two concerts, oh, okay. so you won't hear it. But I'm, I'm curious if you could tell me a little bit about the rehearsal process, because um, it's such a complicated piece, and I know most of that music, and there, there, there's a lot to rehearse. <laughs> um, do you do you have any memories of what that was like? Or oh how, yeah, you know? I mean, Mingus, <laughs> as as our bassist Boris Klauslov says, is he really loved the whole workshop concept, and he he discovered that people really loved to watch uh, the whole thing of how musicians put this together. So he would do that on the bandstand, you know. But as he said, if you didn't like it, you wouldn't get your money back, you know. But I think so much of it, uh, in fact, it's funny because I talked to Charles McPherson about this, and he was saying that uh, when he was in the band, uh, Charles would teach them everything by ear. And then once he got to a certain point, I guess when he was satisfied with it, then he would write it down and kind of formalize it. And I think that was a lot of his process. Of course, with the big band, he was smart enough to know that this was not going to work. But with the small groups, a lot of it was about that. And, you know, I think he was always into that creative moment. It wasn't like, okay, we've got it, and this is exactly how we're going to do it on the concert. And even now, you know, we workshop things and... You know, it's always on the edge. You know, uh, like I tell people, some nights it sounds like the band is going to heaven. Some nights it sounds like the band is falling down a flight of stairs. Sometimes it's in the same tune. But, you know, <laughs> you know, well, you know, it's one of those things. You risk and you will receive, you know. You can't, <laughs> you know, you can't stand by on the side, on the side and think that's going to happen. It ain't going to happen like that. Yeah. So. You know? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I like what you say about standing on the side, which is not what Mingus did, right? Um, I think he used the stage in a way that provoked his audience, and it also provoked his musicians too that he worked with, and you sense that tension in the band, <laughs> thankfully. And I'd say, I mean, I first learned of who he was by the recording with, with Charlie Parker and. Max Roach and Bill Powell, right? So who's the bass player, right? But then I learned about his group when I was in high school. And I learned about his group because it didn't sound like Train's group. It didn't sound like Miles's group. It felt more political. And it felt more free. It didn't sound like Ornette's group either. And they did things with dynamics and tempos and texture that I thought, oh, that's, that's a real group dynamic. Uh, and there's a lot of agency in the group sound. The group sound is about agency. It isn't about precision as much as it's about agency, people having the freedom. And him having the freedom to stop a song, too, <laughs> when it wasn't going right. So when I was in high school, I was looking for a school to go to. And who were the bands I was listening to? I said, well, let me look at the bands and who's still alive. <laughs> and who's alive that I could study with, you know? And Jackie Byer was the piano player. And I was listening to Jackie thinking, wow, he's playing everything historically, which Mingus does, you know? So he's looking at people who are not simply original in their intention as a musician, but also that they have a connection to the lineage and they know how to play it and they don't apologize for playing it either. And he does it. And it's that relationship to folk music and the blues and the vocal tradition and the holler tradition. All those traditions live in it in the same way, you know, that he would like a beautiful, you know, legato. They live equal to one another. And that much kind of, um, that's what drew me to come to New York. It's basically what brought me here. Jackie Byer basically brings me everywhere. 
because of his approach, which I think is also Mingus's approach, was how do you make a band that can sift through all the trouble of the day, workshop stuff in front of people, live, leave people inspired or annoyed too. I think he wasn't really scared of all those things. And that is tough to, for us who are trying to become professional musicians, <laughs> He wasn't looking at the work. It felt like to me, at least, he wasn't looking at the work that way. It was it was gonna be something you would have to fight for, and it was worth fighting for, because of the joy or the power you would enable in other people. And so that band, you know, really was there. That Mingus group with Jackie and Dolphy and Danny Richmond, they for me are the marker for how the band, my band works. It's like the, the way they roll around and all of that is the way I try to treat my band as agencies, too. Great. Maybe I have a follow-up question for you, too, Jason. So did Jackie talk much about Mingus? If so, I'm curious what he had to say yeah, about that experience of working with him. He did. And, and he talked about not only, you know, I think a lot of people want to talk about the tension between the band, right? And he didn't mind talking about the fights they had. You know, like Jackie had some skin condition during a concert and like something about, he said something about the sun where they were playing started to make him break out in hives. So he ran off the stage. Jackie left the stage because he couldn't take it anymore. And at the end of the concert, Mingus comes running off the stage too, like, you know, cursing, like, what the, you know, how dare you, you know, and, and he picks up the axe, you know. And Jackie picks up the fire extinguisher. And it was like, yo, let's go. <laughs> but that's the love they had for each other, too. <laughs> um, he also talks about, like, when you're talking about this formalizing part, like, getting the music to a place and then writing it down. Jackie talks about being, at some point, a scribe for him. During, I want to say the piece was Epitaph, you know, uh, that he helps write out. So they kind of, you know, he's... I want to even say, wasn't it in our last conversation we talked uh, about this? I think he wrote out some of the parts to meditations yeah. and integration. Yeah. yeah. Well, pro probably. I mean, Epitaph is so large. I think a lot of people had their their fingers in it, mm -hmm. and I'm sure Jackie did, and Cy Johnson did. You know, but you know, what you're talking about the whole band thing. So often now, I think people people mistake having a project for having a band. Mm. And it's a very different process, you know, because uh, with a project, you don't have that ability to let stuff melt together and make it work the way you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And as far as the personalities, you know, uh, there's another famous jazz musician and folks used to say it's a nice bunch of guys. And Mingus was like that. I mean, like during the period when I knew him, he was very happy, mm. you know, and he he uh, he was trying to lose weight, so he was on a grapefruit diet. So you would see him with a bag of grapefruit, and it was the summer, and he was fair skinned, so he had a pith helmet that he would wear, and he was happy, you know, and everything seemed to be beautiful. And then uh, he went to Europe, and he threw he threw the tennis player down two flights of stairs, mm. you know. What I mean, it was just. A lot of there's a lot of different emotional tension, and I think sometimes I mean there are a lot of different reasons for it. Sometimes uh, we forget that things like that, unfortunately, sell, sell music and still do. You know, whether it's gangster rap or, or somebody getting thrown down a flight of stairs, people love to see you do bad. You know, so. I think sometimes it was playing to that. Sometimes there were all kinds of other emotional and negative circumstances. And he was also a very impatient man. Like we say in the band, at that point, he, he was a 21st century man in the 20th century. And uh, he was upset about a lot of stuff, everything from racism to you just name it. And then, and he just, he wasn't going back down on any of it. So you have all these different elements in this one human being. And you have somebody who's of mixed heritage. You know, there's a great, <laughs> there's a great tenor player in L.A. who used to say that everybody hated him 
for a different reason. Some people hated him because they thought he was Mexican. Some people hated him because they thought he was African-American. And then some people just hated him for being himself, you know. So uh, Mingus caught a lot of that as well. So. Great. Um, so one of the pieces we're playing tonight is Meditations on Integration. Earl's going to play with us. And uh, I've been listening to a lot of recordings of that, and it's with the band with Jackie. And uh, uh, partly because it's my second arrangement. I, I did one earlier, but I wanted to, to, to make it as, as accurate as I could. But it sort of brings up to, for what for me is the crux of one of the issues with his music is every performance is different, first of all. <laughs> Every solo would start out at a different tempo. So what's, what's the right tempo? There is no right tempo. All the backgrounds were slightly different. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, everything was written out at that time. Uh, I don't think any, anything was ever written down. I kind of wish someone, you know, <laughs> during that period would have written it down. From what I've heard, Jackie did write it down for the uh, Monterey concert. It was for that final performance. As far as I know, that was the last performance. So I guess my question is, okay, that's a given. What are the advantages of, of that process? What do you think you learned maybe from Mingus uh, working out some things by ear? Maybe what are some of the advantages of the notated music, and uh, and if you were to teach a piece of his, how would you do it? You know, I, I guess well, that's another question I'm wrestling with. Well, I, th I think, well, first of all, uh, I think Mingus thought more like a painter in some ways. You know, and like you know, he would look at the sign and like, for instance. Uh, he, let's say he might look at Charles Mc, McPherson like red and somebody else like blue, and how he mixed them together was his particular art. Now, if you think about it, and remember one of his big mentors, mentors was Duke. You know, Duke would take a piece like Prelude to a Kiss. Now, nobody's going to play Prelude to the Kiss, to a Kiss, on the alto saxophone, like Johnny Hodges, because he was a very romantic kind of person. So the next time it comes up, it's not the saxophone. It's Ray Nance playing the violin. You see what I'm saying? He's looking past the instrument to the personality. And because of that reason, in a sense, there's no definitive score to it, because it's always in flux according to the personalities, you know, and that's, that's something that's uh, a unique approach and in some ways a very difficult one in our current environment, you know, because in order to practice that kind of approach, you know, you have to have a band together for a set amount of time. As a general rule, you know, if you, if you think about it, Duke went through great changes to make sure that he kept the same guys, especially, like I say, those primary colors, you know, you know, and, and you know, even somebody like Strayhorn, he kept Strayhorn as, as long as, you know, as, as long as he was alive, you know. And I think that even though Charles alienated uh, people in certain cases, he respected that ability to provide that color or that but of that substance, whatever you want to call it. And that was a very important part of his music. So Jason, what do you think about that? I mean, I love that about looking past the instrument. That's heavy. Um, because I think we do have a stopping point as writers probably right now. Like, oh, this is the bass part. You know, and we stop, like, did you play it right or wrong or whatever? And somehow, listen learning Mingus's music feels more about destination. Like, so how would you get to the destination? How would you get to the destination? Ted Carson, right? Everybody finds their way to it. Um, that to me felt like freeing, you know? There's this, there's, when Thelonious Monk is making his Monkey Town Hall thing, 
there's a tape of him talking about the idea, the big band idea is too stiff. So he didn't want this 10 person group to sound like a big band. He did not want that. He wanted it, you know, he wanted to sound like his hand, but he wanted people to have a little bit of freedom. So he, so they, he's kind of railing against the big band, which is also railing against the generation. <laughs> you know, like the one that's for, you know, people got to make people dance. And I think Mingus also uses that as a tool too. That's that's a generational thing, right? People saying, okay, well, my father did this, but you know, I have some other rules. But the other thing I think when you talk about it, being like a painter is I'm reminded of a story that the sculptor Richard Serra, who's a very prominent sculptor, works with big, huge slabs of iron that sometimes jut out of the ground or curve, right? Steel, thank you. And, uh, and Richard Serra talks about growing up in San Francisco and going to the jazz workshop and cutting school in high school to go, to go see Mingus practice. <laughs> And he says he saw him once one afternoon practicing and the band walks to the stage and Mingus, you know, picks up his bass and the bartender turns off the overhead ceiling fan. And when Mingus understands that the fan is going off, puts his bass down, runs to the bar, jumps over the bar, grabs the bartender, throws him up against the wall and tells him, I was using that. Hmm. And then Richard Serra, kid Richard Serra, is watching this and says, oh, like what is, what is usable material for an artist, for a musician? Is it just the instrument or is it the room or is it the fan? You know, like where does the limit of what a material is, which years later Serra goes on to do whatever he does. I had him tell me that story in his own words so that I could hear it come from his voice and see him get excited about that moment when he realized that material it could, could be anything, you know. And Mingus is thinking about this too, about place, about the idea of a workshop, about interrogation, threatening people. <laughs> and he makes music like that because that's what he experiences. You know, like nobody just jumps and decides this is how I'm going to treat people, right? Like the, the idea that he would come on the stage and be objective is foolish, you know? And I think when I would watch that band and those recordings, like in Oslo, their famous concert of them playing in Oslo, and watching Jackie Byard in the middle of the concert all of a sudden play Lift Every Voice and Sing, the Black National Anthem, which is a song that was birthed in this school, too. <laughs> um, but when he plays that song, he's bringing the struggle all the way to Norway. <laughs> At the same time that people are struggling here in the country, you know? And I think when you say, okay, he could be nice, then he goes to Europe, and he gets, yeah, you know, because, well, even today when that happens, it's still, there's a tension about where does the struggle live? How do you represent it in the music? And I know when I did a project recently at the Kennedy Center where we tried to play Mingus's music with a sense of Mingus in it, I got a singer named Georgia Ann Muldrow because she represents the politics of now in a way that I think Mingus does too. And we went back through his music and chose like seven pieces to pull up and put a different kind of beat on, but have the attitude of the way we think he would think about what's happening right now today. And it, and it was a beautiful thing to go through two days of rehearsal, like how would you teach a Mingus piece of, yeah. of music to people? And we had a lot of fun kind of like pulling it up, you know. Yeah. You, you know, it, it's funny that you, you mentioned Hall Overton because, you know, that was one of the albums that I really loved, you know, the big band stuff. And actually, I called his house because I wanted to study with Hall because that, that was the orchestrator who worked with Monk. And he had passed two days before, oh, wow. Wow. you know. But that thing you talk about with Mingus and how Mingus used, well, he basically used whatever was in his scope to do what he wanted to do, you know. And there's a great story about him. Uh, playing a gig and the audience is talking and finally he just says you know what we want to play four bars and then you get to talk for four bars <laughs> and, <laughs> which is some classic Charles stuff you know but he was always he was always uh, a man of the moment and uh, some of those moments were so uh, unforgettable both musically and mm -hmm. every other way you know I, I was sitting in the Vanguard one night, and Tommy t 
Turrentine, Stanley's brother, who's a great trumpet player in his own right, comes in the vanguard. And he kind of sneaks in the vanguard. I'm like, what's up with this? And he says, well, you know, I can't let Max see me because when I played with Mingus here in the vanguard, Charles blew out the sound system. And whenever I'm in the vanguard, after about five or ten minutes, Max remembers that and throws me out. Mm. You know, but it was always, yeah, you know, but it was always this um, the good and bad. There were all, there's always going to be a memorable moment. Mm. And when you talk about artists like Charles, part of that is that you don't know what's going to happen, but you definitely know that something's going to happen. Oh, right. <laughs> you know, and that keeps you coming back for more and that keeps you on the edge of your, of your seat listening for this thing that's going to happen, mm -hmm. you know. And that alone is priceless, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So maybe I have one more question, and then perhaps the audience has questions. Uh, so we've been working on music, including uh, meditations on integration. Um, and I guess I've been struggling, as it sounds like you have in your own way, to teach you know, how to play this music um, in a way that resembles the recordings that I've heard, has that same spirit. And, and a lot of what I find that I'm saying is, well, it's not enough just to play, you know, because we we're reading from scores for the most part, but you need to internalize that or kind of personalize that or say whatever that is in your own voice, um, which is not the norm in big band music. I guess that's mm -hmm. where the tension is. And I'm curious, like in the Mingus big band, I would imagine, because the, the band has its own unique sound, is that something that happens automatically? Or do you have to, well, like when, when you hear a, a new player who's never played in the trombone well, section, do you have to tell them this I mean, is how it works? <laughs> we, don't, we don't think about the recordings because we look at it like it's still a work in progress. Now, one thing I will say is, you know, uh, with our family, when we had our first child, we always thought that, you know, like new parents, that we were going to teach the kid to do this and this and this and this. And that's not what happens. Mm -hmm. When the baby cried one way, you responded one way because you knew they needed to be changed. When, when they cried another way, you responded a different way because you knew they needed to be fed. And I think in many ways it sounds weird, but the music is, is like that. And there's something about the playing of that music as you play it and you grow into it. You get emotionally attached in a way. You know, it, it, it was funny. We did a gig in, I think it was, no, it was Aarhus. It was Aarhus. Uh, in Denmark, and we'd been on the bus for I don't know how many hours. So we get backstage, and it was it was the opening uh, concert for this festival, and it was in the lobby of this big building. So all they did was kind of they they put a, a a divider on one side, so that was our dressing room. Well. A few of us disagreed with what the set would be. And it got to that point where people had to be separated because it started to get, you know, there's that potential violence. <laughs> and then when the review came out, the reviewers said that the band was so in Dominguez that they played a tape of him going off with the musicians. <laughs> and they didn't realize that that was what was happening live, you know. But, the, <laughs> but I mean, it is a, there's an emotional thing, you know, and people, you know, I think one of the things that Sue looked for, just like Mingus, is that everybody had strong, has strong personalities. So we always have to, uh, we also have to have that understanding of one one another, but as far as as uh, 
as learning the music, I think one of the biggest things is getting everybody to understand that there's a certain freedom involved. And like they say, with a freedom, there is a responsibility. You know, like for instance, there's, what is it? It was last night, what am I saying? Last night, we were playing a piece and the band was having problems getting to the end of the piece, you know? And I just stood up and expanded my trombone and did like this and cut the band off. <laughs> now, I'm not necessarily the band leader, you know, but, you know, like the kind of thing we were talking about, you know, you look around and you say somebody should do something and after a while you realize that you're somebody. And one of the important things about playing that music is that, you know, you have to be an active participant. That means sometimes stopping the band. That means sometimes playing a solo when you're not even supposed to play a solo, but the field is right and something's got to happen. So you have to make educated choices. And a lot of times uh, we tend to think, well, uh, I don't want to make that choice because that's going to be the wrong choice. No, the wrong choice is not making any choice. And I think that's one of the big lessons. And when you teach mm -hmm. folks, you know, I think that that's part of it. I think it's also a sociological thing. You know, if you're playing in a band, you have to realize that it's not good enough <clears throat> to play a good solo. If you are a drummer in a quintet and you only play good solos, that means, <clears throat> excuse me, that means you sound sad four-fifths of the time. For real. I want you to think about it for a minute. <clears throat> so even when you're not playing, you have got to be in it. You know, I always use the analogy in my head, and this applies to, across the boards in a sense. I get up on the stand and I play. Now, there's a guy who comes in the club. He only comes out once a year. He digs ditches for a living. He plunks down how much money? You know what I'm saying? Now, I have a responsibility to him to deliver. You know, it's not just about my solo. You know, because nobody goes there, and I'm very seldom, except for us musicians, you go and say, Oh, the piano player was wonderful, but the bass player wasn't happening. No, people come in there and say the band sounds sad. Either it sounds good <laughs> or it sounds sad. And we're conditioned now to think in terms of music, not just jazz, but music like a private performance experience. Man, nothing could be further from the truth. Everybody's got to throw down, and you got to throw down together. That's it. You know, when you were saying that, like, that, and talking about like how the how the Mingus Big Band works, and I was thinking one of the things he lays into those songs is songs where everybody has to clap, songs where everybody has to yell. You know, like songs where you have to be part of a community, not a musician. You got to be part of the street. It's like a street team is on stage, and those are those are the folk elements that you don't ever need an instrument for to pull people together in a song. That for me is still the powerful part about continually throughout his compositions is that that is all his folk sensibility that he never like sh shoes off the table, you know, for his pursuit of Duke Ellington, who also has his folk tradition all laid throughout it too. But he never keeps that off. And I think one thing we were talking about earlier was his ability to also acknowledge it and then write songs for people. Like all these songs that are dedications to people, people in the family tree. You know, a lot, a lot of people hide the stuff from not only themselves, but they especially hide it from their audience. But he doesn't. He's writing songs for his daughter. He's writing songs for Lester Young. Like he's writing songs for Ellington, you know? And he's, he's, he's I don't know, it's, it's beyond poetry what he gets to. Uh, but it's that kind of, well, what we might, I might say is a kind of honesty, you know, that a lot of us pursue, you know? And so he found, I think he found like a really unique mixture <laughs> of how to put that all together. One thing I was talking, thinking about earlier was also how he plays with people. Like that's the composition part, but then let's just talk about the bass player part. The bass player part is like, 
the decisions she's making, they are provocative, you know. And specifically, if I think about one song where, of course, a lot of people would know this song from Money Jungle when he plays Florette African. That bass line, I think he comes up, well, I don't, I don't want to pontificate about why, but let me do it anyway. <laughs> but I think he comes up with that crazy bass line because he knows Ellington is going to play something crazy because Ellington is a crazy player. He's a crazy piano player, except he's got a nice tuxedo on. For me, he's still an unbelievable Unbelievably odd pianist. He does not make obvious He's choices. Very underrated as a pianist. You know? he really so, is. so 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 Ming just coming in and is like, okay, well, I'm gonna have to put some extra sauce to make this feel like something. And when that comes together as a mixture, oh, mm-hmm. that's you know, those are supposed to be the signposts for us as musicians about brave choices. You know, that seemingly you would never write on a page and say, This is gonna work. But somehow it does. Or maybe it works because it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. You know? And I think he looks for that kind of juxtaposition, let alone then what he does when he puts his bass down and then he goes to the piano. Mm-hmm. And when I heard, and it was late, and it was after Jackie died that I heard Mingus's piano record. And when I heard the piano record, I, I didn't know who it was. And I thought, whoever this is has figured out this is the perfect way to play solo piano. This is perfect. And when they said it was Charles Mingus, I was a little bit dejected. <laughs> but then I picked up my spirits because then I said, well, the piano player he hired is my teacher. Okay, great. So I'm back on now. I feel all right now because he had to get a piano player who could outplay him, you know, because of the sense and mastery of phrases. And the last thing when you say about how that music feels and to play it in a way so it feels personal is, you know, like combinations of tones, change your body structure. You know, this Milford Graves stuff, right? Playing a tone, adding them together, it'll change your whole construct. And Mingus's phrases are unlike anyone else's. And you ain't gonna get it just by looking at it. <laughs> you're gonna have to put it, you have to digest it and put it in your hand, in your body, play it on a saxophone or whatever. And when you do that over and over, it is its own buffet of a feeling. Uh, so tonight will be special just to have all those Sympathetic tones in the room that come from his pen, um, but it's it's it's, a, it's, it's extremely unique, um, and it's, I'm glad that people are getting a taste of it. Mm-hmm. Great. Sure.
And that's a big deal. So is if you went to New York City in the early 60s, Mingus was there all the time. And I never saw any altercations, the, the thing on the set, uh, on the set um, uh, which is, I don't know if people know, but Jackie Byard actually come from Worcester, <laughs> 50 miles from here. Um, and I remember talking to him back then. And uh, But but Mingus, uh, uh, um, I think he he could stand up in public and speak, and there were a few jazz musicians can never do that. I mean, seriously. And in New York, there was a famous, re uh, which was recorded in the press, maybe in the New York Times, one night on Saturday night, everybody's talking like they're doing these jazz clubs, unfortunately. And Miller stood up and said, you know, and, and gave this speech. I had enough of all your talking. You come over your Saturday night dates. You know? We're playing jazz. So he said that, probably in the five spot party where I used to see him. And, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, how many people would they do that anywhere? He had no problem of doing it, and he's still, and he's still higher because he's dependable. Most of the time, but I did see him one night, and J Danny Richmond on drums wasn't there, and he said, well, Danny's in jail tonight. Oh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was <laughs> another, another occasion, but, um, but Mingus, to his credit, and it's, a, a, I think, a really important part of the history of jazz, which is not appreciated, it's very difficult economically to keep jazz together. The size of a jazz club is often quite small, and then people don't pay a lot of money, and how the hell do you sustain a band? You know, if you're Miles Davis, no problem. Mm -hmm. But um, so Mingus had this history of being a good manager. I think that's it at a distance. Mm -hmm. He was a, he knew how to manage people, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sure. He, uh, and let me just say, in all of this, one uh, what I think made very negative thing about him that. I don't know you know what uh, nobody's mentioned. He wrote a book. Mm -hmm. You know who wrote a book? Mingus? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's called Beneath the Underdog. Must have been written you know, middle, somewhere around that time. And it's the most disgusting book I've ever seen. <laughs> it's kind of sh appalling about his treatment of young girls uh, sexually. I don't know how it ever got published. But then since we're talking about the whole of Charles Mingus, I will mention that to you. Beneath the underdog, great time, great title. But you know, it, it, it's history. Uh, it, and then the last thing uh, I saw him all lots of times at, at, at the uh, the Five Spot Cafe. Uh, and then then I went actually went back to England, and uh, and then I heard on public radio or something one day he would have been his wife in the last years of his life. And I didn't, you know, and, and it was very moving because and I think she's written a book on it. She was right, he is dying now of some form of cancer, I think. And he's in, there is in, she is driving around Mexico in a van um, for a faith healer, mm -hmm. looking for this faith healer to, re, to, to cure him. So he's in, he's in pain, he's in this van, very uncomfortable, and his wife is driving him. They never see the pain, uh, the pain healer, and he dies. So he had a terrible ending, and, it's, and, uh, and I only know that by chance. I don't, I don't know anything. But this his wife, wife, who I think was white, um, uh, they did get married, um, I believe, and I think she may have written a book. But, it, but it, I would say he is a man of tremendous uh, passion and drive and accomplishment. And it's hard to do those things as a jazz, uh, in jazz. You can do, <laughs> you can do some of them, <laughs> but to hold the group together um, and write all this original music mm -hmm. um, is, you know, I think uh, it's, he's a great figure. Yeah. And, um, Thank you. And it's worth listening to. <laughs> You're yeah. lucky all the music is there. Yeah. 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 But yeah, you know, Charles died from ALS. And uh, I think I must have seen him probably during one of his last performances. So at that point, I was working with Dad and Mel. We were, yeah. Both bands were at Nice. Uh, but even on some of the videos, when you see like some of the later videos and he's playing, 
You know, uh, I remember one musician men mentioned to me, he said that Charles had problems playing time. And I thought, I think when you look at the video, what I walked away with was that he was already in the early stages of ALS. Because when you listen to earlier work, he sure had no problem playing time. But that same spirit, you know, like because he'd all be singing and talking while he was playing, and he was very quiet. Mm. And when you look at his hands, mm. you can see it's not functioning quite the same. The same. And uh, you know, Sue, Sue wrote the book about uh, a life with Charles, and uh, a lot of it is really deep. And I think one of the things, one of the takeaways from that is that we always have this thing about Mingus, this angry man. And the other end of it was he was also a real romantic. You know, there's a great story in the book uh, where he comes up to Sue. I think well, I don't think they were married yet. But he comes up he comes up to Sue's apartment and says, you got to come with me. In fact, he, I think he just called her down. He was in a taxi. you got to come with me. you got to come with me. I said, Charles, what's going on? Just come with me. Just come with me. And he takes her. He takes her uh, to Grand Central, Grand Central Station. Now, there's a place in Grand Central Station where if you're in one corner, people can hear you very clearly when you talk in the other. And he put her in the other corner and walked, walked to the next one and whispered, I love you. So this is not somebody who's just angry all the time. But I think one of the takeaways is that he was always a little bit bigger than life. When he was sad, he was really sad. When he was really happy, he was really happy. When he was really depressed, he was very depressed. You know, there's there's some great stories like where uh, I think he took Sue to a restaurant. I sit down at a table because he's a big guy. So he sits at a table for four. And the waiter's up and holding. You can't sit here. This is for four people. And he says, well, if I order enough food for four people, can I sit? And he says, yeah. So he ordered four steaks and gave her one and ate three. You know, he did the same thing. There's some drink from New Orleans where he did something like that. But I think uh, uh, two of the things that are probably most misunderstood about Charles is, uh, first of all, like I said, that that uh, that impatience for things to be right and the passion that goes along along with that, you know, and also that whole thing about him just being angry, you know. Uh, there were a lot of different qualities that were rolled up into it and and a lot of different emotions that ping-ponged around it, you know, like uh, I think I, I was just telling you a story about him uh, throwing a tenor player down the stairs, but the other end of that was that I'm not sure, but I think that that same tenor player had just finished telling him something about staying in in Europe. And after the experience he had with Dolphy, you know, uh, if you get a chance, you should watch it. There's a, uh, there's a rehearsal video on YouTube where he's talking to Eric Dolphy and talking about how much he miss, he's going to miss him. And, of course, he probably never saw him again in this world, you know. And I think that one of the things that set him off, because a lot of times it was almost like an emotional thing, but I think when this tenor player started talking about staying in Europe, he started to feel kind of deserted, and one thing kind of led to another. And there's no excuse for violence. I'm just saying that I think that's how it got there, you know. So so it's a, it's a lot more complicated, and it's like a seven-layer cake. The more you learn about them, the more you realize that there's more to learn about. <laughs> so, you know. so, any other questions, yeah, Jonathan? Yeah, I um, just want to say thank you for welcoming me to this event, especially. Um, I just want to ask my question has to do with conflict. Um, I guess I've been in a lot of situations where there's kind of conflict or contention um, on the bandstand or off the bandstand. Um, and I'm wondering about some of the experiences you've had, and maybe if, if Mingus's music has kind of opened up a space to explore that conflict through music related um, to it. I'm sorry. 
So yeah. um, have you experienced conflict on the bandstand? And if so, how, how have you resolved that? Or Yeah, and has maybe some music maybe opened up a space to lean into that conflict? Well, usually, if there's conflict on the bandstand, well, it hap two things happen. One is quite often it's resolved after we get off the stage. Now, there are some cases with some people who feel really upset about something, and we'll just give them the floor. You know, they get to say what they think, you know, and uh, it just runs that cycle. And then we work it out in the music. Because, you know, I know this is going to sound upsetting to you, but in my experience, in all my years, I've never seen anybody die because they played a B natural on a C7. <laughs> you know, so you have to put stuff in perspective. You know, you know what I'm saying? So as musicians, whether you like it or not, there's a certain amount of theater. You know, you, you look at Miles Davis, he turns his back to the audience and it helps him do what he needs to do, but there's also theater there. You know what I mean? So there's that combination of these two things going on, you know. But the difference with our theater, our theater is that we have the right to express what we feel is wrong right there, you know. One of the reasons, you know, like I said, I grew up as a kid playing the blues. And one of the reasons I love playing the blues is the blues is like the daily paper. Especially when, when you play with blues musicians and they play the blues, you know what happened that day, you know? And in terms of something that Jason was saying, even with my father, my father played in the band in World War II, and, and during that time, a lot of the guys in the band would come out of Lunchford's band, Basie's band, stuff like that. And when you talk to those guys, there's certain tunes they wouldn't play. And they said, because whenever we played that tune, there'd be a fight. You know, one of them was flying home. <laughs> but, but for real, and my belief, I mean, I think certain things set a tone. It's a combination of things. Certain things set a tone. Certain tunes you tend to play at a certain point in the night where maybe folks have ingested different substances, you know, and, and all of that kind of thing. But, you know, music is a remarkable thing. And uh, a lot of times we get so wrapped up in the notes that we forget that you can affect people's outlook on life, at least for that moment that you have them. So, yeah. Any other questions? I think, I think I did, but you know, um, I think something that people really underestimate is, you know, both he and Max Roach had a record company together, and 
growing up in this period, you don't really get the sense of uh, how brave that was. Because during that period, you know, the people who controlled record companies also controlled the Teamsters. And if you put out a record, they could pretty much kill your record just because you can make the record. But you know, Teamsters are the truckers. They get your record to marketplace. Now you put it online, yada, yada, yada. But back then, you know, they could really kill your record. And if that didn't work, they might do something else. So deciding to start a record company that went against the grain then uh, was an amazingly, amazingly brave thing to do. And, and like you say, it stemmed from that want of ownership of your own, um, your own product. And uh, I think he was always kind of aware of, of that situation, you know, and I think that was a driving force in, in uh, some of his struggles, like when he would perform, how he would perform, and that kind of thing. Uh, I think we're going to wrap it up soon, but thank you so much, Earl, for coming up for this. And uh, again, thank you for having me. please uh, come to the concert tonight. You'll hear Earl play with a big band. Jason's going to play as well. Uh, thank you, Fra Frank Kralberg, for organizing all of this. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, happy 100th. <laughs> so his, his birthday would have been Friday, I think, this Friday. Is that right? I know the the uh, Mingus's birthday is yeah. it the twenty second, right? Yeah. 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 It's a uh, it's a very very interesting time to be playing his his music. It's a very interesting time to be playing his music uh, because you know they talk about classic uh, classical music, and what we call classical music is music that. Uh, stands the test of time and speaks to the human condition. And uh, clearly all of his, Charles's music seems to hold up to those two qualities. So... Do the people buy his records today? Do they? Some are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think, so. I mean, I, what is significant to me? But, yeah, I think I think people do. Yeah, I mean, but also Mingus is, goes beyond like jazz scope. M you know, the, his music is played by rock people. You know, Johnny Mitchell. Like every generation has somebody who's talking about Mingus. They're putting Mingus on skateboards. He's on. He's going skateboard T-shirts. Right? <laughs> like he's beyond a jazz community right now. As kind of like Thelonious Monk is too. There's yeah. certain people who have stood up for so much. And thankfully, I also think this is what they had as a vision for themselves, too. Ellingson is in the same way. They didn't think of themselves as just to live in this jazz globe yeah. as much as what they represented as a... Yeah. I mean, I think there's commercialization of all kinds of things. He's been, he's been dead long. I mean, he's been I, gone for a while. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, the, the other thing, you, you know, is that... Uh, I remember playing in the Time Cafe, and I used to love to play in the Time Cafe mm -hmm. for just the reason you're naming. The people who came down there, a lot of them didn't know anything about jazz. They just knew about this music and the band, you know? Yeah. You know, and uh, this, this, it keeps cropping up. His name uh, crops up, and uh, it's like guerrilla warfare sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, you, Have you guys seen the Nova, the Supernova? They named a supernova after Mingus. He's the first jazz musician that they named a supernova. And it is the largest one that they found so far. Look at that. You know, so I Talk mean. Talk about commercial. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, I know what you're saying. We, all, we always tend to have this concept about jazz. It was, you know, I hear people say jazz is dying. It's not what it should be. I am of this distinct belief that God forbid they dropped the bomb the only thing that would be left are roaches and jazz because <laughs> those are the things that know how to adapt 
you know, and it, it may, it has an ebb and flow to it. But every time somebody tries to kill it off, there's one guy in the corner who says, you know what, there might be another way of doing this. So, you know, the question is, are you going to be the guy in the corner? <laughs>